Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. This is episode 226. I'm excited for this episode today. I'm delighted to welcome onto the podcast John McMahon and Marcus Soriano. Lads, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for inviting us. I know this is going to be a popular one because of the fact that we put out on social media that you're both coming on. We've had quite a few questions sent in of different topics, which hopefully we'll get into in a little bit. But first of all, I always like to start on backgrounds. We're not going to go too in detailed on backgrounds, but what we are going to do is, is give a little insight into both into what you're both doing at the moment. So, John, can you kick us off? Absolutely. Cheers, Ben. So I'm a reader, which for those that don't live in England is equivalent to an associate professor in sport and exercise biomechanics at the University of Salford. I only got promoted to that last August. I was a lecturer in s and in biomechanics for the last 10 years up to that point. And I'm currently the research team lead for sport and exercise now at Salford as well. So we've got a multidisciplinary team spanning from physiotherapists through to nutritionists, sport scientists, s and biomechanics, typically what you might see in like an institute of sport really, but academic equivalents. And um, that, that's really interesting stuff that we maybe get onto a little bit uh, later on about what we're doing with that. And then outside, I, I kind of serve across a few journals. I'm a NSCA a grants committee member for, for the NSCA Foundation. So like most people, keeping busy, trying to do research and some volunteer leadership roles and, and the main day job, really. Brilliant. What about yourself, Marcus? Well, thank you for the invitation, Ben. Uh, well, I'm from Spain and uh, I'm already working at uh, the university, well, Camilo José Cela University, which is placed in Madrid. My position, my equivalent position would be like a senior lecturer in sport biomechanics and also as strength and conditioning. And well, uh, something interesting from me is that uh, I met John, Paul Comfort and all these guys from the University of Salford because I decided to, to do my, piece, my international PhD stay at the University of Salford. Then uh, I had the opportunity to learn a lot from these guys. I also had the opportunity to to know the culture of uh, strength training practices in another country, how, how is UK, and uh, it was very important to me. And after that, I tried to apply that here in Spain. And I think that uh, my main area of research is just like that, trying to apply the, the strength training and also the neuromuscular performance here in Spain. That's why, well, uh, we recently opened a new title in Spain. It's a master's. It's an official master, so it gives you access to, to doctoral studies. And it's in a master in strength training and neuromuscular performance. And I'm the program leader of, the, of that master. And I think that's all, no more than that. Perfect. That's awesome. I wanted to dive into some of the work that you've both been doing collaboratively and also individually. So, John, can you go take us through some of uh, maybe the main focuses at the moment for yourself and also we can then tie into some of the work that you've been doing with Marcus as well? Yeah, it's, it's all kind of intertwined for me. So the um, I kind of fell into force plate based research in about 2060, give or take. I I'd, I'd finished my PhD, decided it was too complicated to hang ultrasound probes and EMG leads and 3D uh, motion data and all the rest of it off participants and expect to be easily integrate that into somebody's practice working in, in professional sport. So when, when I began to think about what I could do with the time I had available, at the time I was working as a strength and conditioning coach for North uh, West England netball and also Manchester Thunder netball. And they had regional testing for each of the, you know, Northwest, Northeast, Southeast and Southwest regions where you would test each of the players and then feed that data back into a national database, basically. And I thought I'm going to use force plates because I know how to use force plates. So I did that. And then all the girls that I was looking after had the worst jump performances, like of the whole um, of the whole national squad that was pulled together. And I realized it was because people were using different kit in different places. So some might be using a, a jump and reach. Some might be using a jump mat that overestimated the jump height. Whereas I was being very, I thought at the time, clever, doing a, a full-on force plate analysis of vertical jumps, thinking it was going to make me look good. And in fact, I had to really then explain why my girls were the worst, apparently, on, on their profiling. So that kind of prompts a, an interest for me in terms of understanding what tech is being used by practitioners on the ground and how I can fit something in at the time where I was teaching very high hours each week 
um, to then contribute to that that part of the research process, basically. So m- most of my research has been on force plate based applications, mainly in rugby league. Um, but more recently, it's been in professional football. And we have been doing work with Marcos for the last probably nine months now, give or take, um, yeah. in a big multi-center study. But Marcos actually, he's lived in Manchester a couple of times and it was in his last day where he was facilitating some of the force plate testing we were doing um, in the UK. So he was coming around to League Two clubs, National League clubs, all the way through to Championship here in the UK. And then about two weeks before he left to go back to Spain, he just casually dropped in that he knew some people at La Liga teams and asked if it'd be worthwhile mentioning to them whether they would want to be involved. And I'm like, dude, I've known you since 2017. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you're just dropping that in now, but... I will talk about that a bit about that more later on, but we've basically been going around collecting data, mainly performance-based data, so largely bilateral lower body tests, counter movement jump, rebound jump, and isometric mid thigh pull, um, largely through a funded PhD student that I have, who's co-funded between Hawking Dynamics, which is a force plate uh, technology company, and Salford as well, and effectively. What we're trying to do is understand how to uh, benchmark those low limb multi-joint tests on force plates within football populations, both youth and senior, understand which metrics out of the vast sea of metrics you can generate from the software these days actually is reliable for, for different purposes. And then we've touched on an element of talent identification as well. So looking at the physical qualities for, say, under 18s, um, say, you know, Youth Alliance League, which is... Uh, category four academies mostly i think in the uk and maybe some cat three academies we've tested as well and how they compare physically to say senior men in league two or national league for example just to try and understand if they were to then progress through the 23s into senior play where there might be some physical deficits compared to what we've seen in the senior male data and the reason we started off with that basic stuff and i called it basic stuff is because actually we kidded ourselves into thinking more of this research had been done than actually has been. Um, I think we all think that these obvious benchmarks and normative data in these different populations, and there really isn't, especially with methods where you've got a large sample, like in football research, the sample sizes are generally quite small. So what we've been able to do through this funded PhD and through collaboration with Marcos is to go around and do a big multi-club study, both involving UK based football teams and and Spanish football teams um, with a view to then get some from MLS out in the States. We've got some South American teams that might be coming on board as well, um, where we're using, importantly, the same kit in the same places after going through some training to allow us to pull that data together. So it, it's quite broad to begin with, and I'll talk later on, if you don't mind, about some of the specific directions we're looking to take our research going forward. I don't want to hog the mic too much, so m- maybe you pass over to Marcos at this stage. Yeah, no, brilliant. I, I suppose, Marcus, if you could extend on that, because John's give the information around some of the work that you did over in Manchester in the UK. Well, when you headed back over to Spain, that those links that you had with those clubs over there, how does that look and what sort of work have you done with those? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, John, for all the introductions. And, well, yes, uh, when I came back to Spain, uh, actually, I realized that uh, in Spain, I think the people, they are training very well because, of course, we, we have teams and uh, performing very well at their respective leagues. However, uh, I also realized that our practices in terms of strength and conditioning were, I don't know if uh, to say, uh, a little bit out of date, something like that. Mm. So... If you ask to many strength and conditioning coaches, for example, they don't usually use uh, force plates. And for me, it was something that impressed and shocked me at that time. And I said, why? You can take many valuable information and also you need to understand that information and also to interpret that information with your own practice, with your own experience to make good judgments. So then I realized that uh, it was an opportunity to, let's say, to do some consulting to these teams, especially to help them. And also, well, uh, it could be kind of a win-win project in terms of, for them, it could be a valuable information. And for us, it could be a valuable information also for research. 
which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, an obligation, something mandatory for uh, academic purposes. Then uh, there is uh, one contact in Real Madrid that he works with me at, uh, in my university. His name is Victor Paredes, and uh, he is working for uh, Real Madrid as a well, in the Department of uh, Rehabilitation and Readaptation. And well, I told him, I asked him, do you think, could it be interesting for you? He said, yes. And then we started doing that. And of course, uh, when you start with Real Madrid, let's say that you start at the top, then it's something that, uh, well, attracts the other teams and also other sports and they start to make some questions. That's how we started, and that's how we are working now. Now we've got, a, let's say, a research line with a John, not only on football and especially in Real Madrid, but also with other sports, as handball, for example. We have been working with handball, other racket sports, even with uh, tactical populations that they were interested in uh, developing some protocols, some methodologies to, to assess their neuromuscular performance. So it has been a very productive uh, time, although it was only nine months, but we have been working very hard and with many population. We have tested, I think, that more than 12 teams in terms of collective sports. And I think it will go on because in Spain, we need that change. And I think that, uh, well, uh, new softwares of uh, Hawking Dynamics has that is easy to use, also is quite intuitive and also is easy to, to trade the data after that and to analyze the data and to interpret the data. I think it's, uh, it, it makes it possible, to be honest. Just on that, Marcus, in terms of those, the data that you're collecting and the testing you're carrying out, what can you go into a bit of detail on that? Like how regular it is, what, what the um, players are actually doing? Yeah, as uh, John said, uh, well, we are mainly using like bilateral testing, like uh, the isometric methane pool to have a, well, uh, an idea of the maximal strength capacity that, they, that the athletes have. Uh, also, we have collected the counter moment gap to have a, let's say, a ballistic uh, expression of force. And we have also collected the counter moment and rebound jump to have a reactive expression of force. And what we have been doing with that is just to analyze those data and to see, well, to create a normative data about uh, those players. And well, you can see at the first at the first sight how uh, it can differentiate for talent identification, for example. So if you look at the academy, let's say under nineteen, and if you look at the at the team that is playing in the national position in the in the in the top uh, league, um, they can jump higher, so they got more ballistic strength. They can or they have more maximal strength, so they perform better in the ISO pool. And also they've got better RSI modified in the, in the counter moment and ribbon jump, so they have more reactive strength. So it means that, I don't know if it is because the maturity status of the athlete, but of course, uh, let's say that the top team has the players with better a strength qualities and a strength capacity. So it means that it can give you some idea about talent identification. Also, if we compare about, uh, well, on a status of training, like better teams versus, let's say, teams from an inferior league or something like that, you can see how those teams, how those players are stronger than the others that they that play in in different leagues so it uh, it has the opportunity you know to 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 think about that why why is it possible no no that's really interesting the other thing on that marcus is i know you mentioned about a few other sports 
So yep. comparatively, football to these other sports, how how do we compare? Because obviously there's been there's a lot of talk on this podcast and others about football and how we prepare. It's interesting to look into other sports as well. Well, it could be interesting maybe to to make the comparison between uh, rugby because uh, John has been working with rugby. And uh, well, we've been, been working, for example, with handball. That is another um, team sport. And uh, we had the opportunity to test one, one team that is from the top league. And uh, well, if we compare the data of that team with the data of uh, the players from uh, this second team of uh, Real Madrid, which is Real Madrid Castilla, we can see that uh, these players are stronger because they, in, in handball, uh, you've got like a more culture of training, the of strength training and, and power development. Because I don't know if you follow uh, handball, but handball is a sport that is very intense in terms of physical development and strength and power abilities. Because it's uh, they have a lot of contact and also the players need to be big, right, mm-hmm. to defend and also to perform well in uh, their modalities. So, for example, the, the big forces are quite higher compared with uh, football players. And in terms of ballistic and reactive strength, I, well, I didn't analyze the data, but I would say that uh, uh, we find a mixture because, uh, of course, um, they are stronger, but also they are heavier, mm-hmm. you know? And when you are heavier, also, maybe you RSI modified or your jump height or some of those measures are affected because you are heavier. So in those teams, uh, like the players, they can weigh about 80 kg to 100 kg. So they are very big guys. However, in football, all the players, they are kind of the same. You know, between 70 kgs to 80 kgs, no more than that. So it's quite a strain to find a player, a football player that weighs 90 kg. Yeah. It's actually, well, it's very rare. I don't know if John has tested, has tested uh, any player like that, any football player like that. So that's something that we need to take into account also when we analyze the data. Yeah, really interesting. John, I was going to ask as well, because obviously Marcus has touched on the culture in Spain and um, the fact that they weren't doing these tests initially and, and Marcus has, has taken the, pro, um, the protocols over and started working with them. Your work in the UK, and I know Marcus has done this as well, throughout the leagues, when you stepped into those clubs, were the majority of clubs doing some sort of testing or were there a few that you stepped into where it was like, like canvas, we don't do anything? It's a really good question. Like we, um, I would say generally, yes, people are doing testing. Like it seems, it's funny, it's almost your own ignorance in some ways, your own biases, but having been somebody that's lived in the UK for the majority of my lifetime, the um, you kind of think that everybody else is also experiencing a similar culture when you relate it in this case to, to sports science. So I was very much more aware of what's going on in Australia, North America and England. And to be honest, everyone has had a culture of testing using some sort of tech for, you know, at least the last decade or so, I should think. Mm-hmm. And I've seen the shift as well within my own role. So we were um, we were talking about what I could see from my window a minute ago, but you've got, you know, Old Trafford, greatest ground of all time, not that I'm biased, okay. um, about, you know, half a mile down, down the road there. Clubs like that and City and, and those kind of clubs, we used to, through the university partnerships, go and either bring players into our own facility and we would test them, particularly injured players, actually, on more of a case-by-case case basis, using full 3D motion analysis and, and in-ground force plates and all these things. And then I've seen that evolution from about 2008 to probably around 2016, 17, where those clubs, especially Premier League clubs, already had... Um, you know, all of the tech now that they need. They didn't really need to outsource to universities, really. So for us as a group at Salford, from a researcher perspective, trying to get into football clubs over here, we have very much had to pitch more from League One down, where even within League One now, though, you've, you've got clubs that have got force plates. I mean, they've all, if you think about it, I suppose, 
GPS is probably one of the early ex examples of tech that all clubs seem to do as standard in, in terms of like match play stuff and training. Um, timing gates and things for sprint testing has been around for a long time now. It's the uh, change has been through using, say, up to electronic systems like up to jump and jump mats in those clubs to people using force plates. But most of the Cat One academies in the UK and most of the Premier League teams have had force plates for a fairly long time now. Quite a few of the championship clubs, if not all, have done as well. And then I'm even seeing now at League One, because they're becoming more accessible through effectively being cheaper, I suppose, that it's starting to filter down. But we've almost had like a, no disrespect to the clubs we've been working with, if anyone's listening, but we've had more of a bottom-up approach because as an outsider group trying to come into a club and uh, to get people involved in our testing, if they're already doing their own protocols and have been doing for a long time, we can't really come in with our own tech and start changing the hardware and the software because it's going to make the comparisons they, they've been doing longitudinally with players that have come through the academy system redundant. We're just going to introduce error mm -hmm. and, and that, that's going to be a barrier. Whereas with the low league clubs, uh, particularly National League and League Two, everyone's been really receptive to get us to come in because they actually haven't got for the clubs that we've been in anyway, like that that level of, of technology. Because even though they're cheap, it's one thing it being affordable now. It's, it's the other thing trying to get the gaffer or whoever's in charge to actually sign off and, and give you the budget for it. So that that's mainly where we've been. And everyone's been inviting us back in as well. So we, we're lucky in the Northwest, as you well know, in and around Manchester, there's, there's such a density of professional football clubs in the immediate area that we don't actually have to travel too far to, you know, to effectively get. If you think about the demographic of League Two, League One, the amount of clubs in and around Greater Manchester alone, actually. And then if you extend up up north slightly towards like Carlisle and Fleetwood, Fylde, like those kind of clubs, they, they're not too difficult. It's like an hour, hour and a half drive for us to, to get in and around. Um. So, so that's been really encouraging and you've been super receptive and it's been interesting this week that those clubs are booking in already for pre-season testing at the end of June, beginning of July. Like normally we get requests about two, two weeks before. Um, but now I think every club has invited us back at least three times already and then we're getting more clubs. In fact, the presentation I did as part of your networking event at Bolton Wanderers a few, few months ago, led on to two more clubs getting involved and we've been in tested those clubs as well. So thanks for that, but because that was your your connection really. Um, so th that's been the difference. I think the, the barriers are, is that at the top level in this country, people have been using the tech, but I still think there's an education gap around actually what to do with the information you generate from the tech. And that doesn't really just apply to force plates. You could apply that to a few other different bits as well. Whereas what's been really refreshing with Marcos is because he haven't got the history of using force plates in the top level of Spain, he's been able to come in because he's a fantastic communicator. He understands the science so well. Um, he's been able to go in at the top level and start from scratch. So there isn't any history that you're trying to deal with around metric selection and test selection. But equally, we've started off on a very basic level, partly because that's where we should start because the research isn't actually up to scratch. But also, we wrote that into our ethics approval, and that's quite a long-winded process. So we had ethics approval to do the bilateral low limb testing and then just add in teams as and when they sign up, whereas we just, at this moment in time, waiting. We're about two months in so far, uh, waiting for the ethics to come back to get us to do some more of the unilateral and isolated joint type isometric testing to allow clubs then to opt in you know, to other things as well, because at the minute we've been restricted by the three tests primarily. Um, so it would be good to then start to offer that in season and pre season at, at you know convenient times where we can establish all of the other lines of inquiry that we're interested in pushing forward. But I would say that the only reason it's been possible to collaborate with Marcos is because of the the cloud based nature of the software these days. Like Marcos and his team have been fantastic at going into Real Madrid and doing the data collection, which I'd, I would love to do, but my wife won't let me go over as many times as as required. <laughs> But I can be sat in sunny, you know, Costa del Salford, having a cup of tea, watching the data come in. And then we work collaborative, collaboratively in that I'll collate the data, send it to Marcos. Marcos then puts all the Spanish interpretations on it because I can speak about only 15 Spanish words. Um, and it's been working really well in that respect. And, and I've got to say as well, um, Hawking Dynamics have been the ones that have been shipping out the plates to Marcos and things to use who free of charge as well I might add I don't know if they want me advertising that but there we are you might have to bleep that bit out but effectively they've helped us through our collaboration I'm, I'm kind of joking it's free through the the, the PhD to, to get the plates out to, to Spain as well um, 
So it, it's just worked really, really effectively because we, we've been trying to do things like this for a long time, but it's rare that you get people in individual clubs that have got the same tech that are willing to share information around what they're doing and to give you a bit more ownership over the standardization of the protocols. So we've managed to break break down those initial barriers as a, as a group. Um, and so far it's been working really well to the point where Marcus has got more uh, La Liga teams and other uh, professional clubs in Spain that are trying to sign up <laughs> testing going forward. Now it's just a case of resourcing that and um, giving Marcus and his team what they need on the ground to, to get that up and running, basically. Mm. If you're listening. Okay, no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. <excuse> <laughs> I wanted to ask because a couple of episodes ago we had Liam Connor on and we spoke up about um some work with force plates in that, that episode too. And one of Liam's tips to practitioners listening was just start collecting, start collecting data at your club. So I'm sure there's a lot of practitioners listening that are like, well, we do, but where should we be focusing? So I might put it out to both of you in, in terms of if there are practitioners at clubs listening, they're doing some of the tests that you've talked about. Is there any advice that you'd be giving them on areas to focus on? Or even if you were then to come and, and work with them, is there anything that they need to be doing? They need to be aware of and be doing before you you sort of work with them. John, do you want to start us off? And then Marcus, I, I'm keen to get you to add on that as well. Yeah, really good question. So um, I, I kind of somewhat agree, but the, I think there's, some extra context to add. I think that the collecting data is good, but there's been a bit of a data collection or mass data collection culture that, that people are aware of um, in sport generally. So it has to be considered data collection. I'm all for people collecting data, but I think it needs the consideration around why are you collecting the data in the first place? What purposes does it actually um, purportedly kind of serve? And so you can't really go wrong with your standard bilateral counter movement jump testing for, for most of the applications that you might want to consider, whether that's benchmarking and telling ID like we've discussed, or whether that's collecting that routinely on a daily basis um, or even weekly basis to give you some proxy for quote unquote neuromuscular fatigue and how that might manifest. Um, especially if you think about the consequence of the World Cup actually pushing for the Premier League teams now three games a week effectively seems to be pretty, pretty standard at the minute and for the remainder of the season then you, you, you've you got through standardizing your protocols, the opportunity to look at the patterns that you may see in those players when you've got high training and match loads that they're experiencing and to monitor the recovery profile. And that's always been the really interesting thing for me in terms of force plates is that it tells you the information that you can't see. So obviously when you see a movement, you, even if you're not quantitatively capturing that movement with motion capture systems, you can qualitatively you know in your mind map that movement against what is in your head as being the criteria for good quality movement for that task what you can't see is the actual forces that led to that movement and so it's about trying to steer away from just monitoring jump height jump height can be sensitive to neuromuscular fatigue it can discriminate between different groups but if you collect your data well on the force plates you can look at the strategies that led to that jump height being achieved and in fact that's normally where it's more illuminating, particularly around neuromuscular fatigue and also muscular, uh, musculoskeletal injury profiling as well. And so the key things for that really are to stick to your protocol, first and foremost, because we have people that, that tend to change things up a little bit. Um, so hands on hips, um, at least two to three trials of any test that you do. Like there's five papers now that have shown that your reliability is better. If you take the average of two to three trials, comparing taking the one that's associated with whatever the outcome variable is. So jump height in a counter movement jump or peak force in an ISO pull. The key thing for the force plate data to actually be usable in, in its full potential is to make sure you get an accurate measurement of body weight. That, that's been one of the key things that we've tried to educate on these past few years, because when I used to test a squad using a jump mat, they just step on and they jump. You didn't have to bother telling them to stand still for a second before they do it. But that, that one second of weigh-in is really important because that goes into the numer numerical integration of the software. Um, to give you things like velocity, displacement, power, and, and the other variables that you can get during the different phases of the jump. An overlooked one is people not standing up f uh, fully straight, fully extended at the hip before they do the jump, because when you look at force traces after they've been collected without any video that's gone with it, like you're assuming, and the software will do the same, that the person's center of mass is in the neutral anatomical position when it starts. 
so that any positional changes i'm doing this is this being video by the way like can people see it out as well yeah <laughs> for those that are only listening i'm waving my hand around now so you can see what i'm talking about um but but effectively it'll give you a a reference point the assumption is is that when you stood up right at the beginning that's your zero position everything else is calculated from that point so you may have seen people, even on social media, if you've not done the data collection yourselves, for anyone that's listening, where they've got a bit of flexion at the hips, players looking down at the feet, they're adjusting the foot position before they're going to do a counter movement jump. And they're already flexed by X number of degrees before they start. So then if you go and test them again, the next time they do it, and now they know that the feet are in the same place they always are on the place when they start. So they might extend the hip a bit more. Straight away, that can give you about four or five centimeters difference in the range of motion they move through, which you might mistakenly think is something that's telling you something about a potential injury risk or, or fatigue where really you just got some some uh you know uh player that's not stood up straight at the start so it's the quality of the force plates is fantastic only if we get our protocols right so it's the same with rebound jumps i don't see any point personally in a rebound jump queuing people to do it in more of a depth jump style where you've got a long ground contact time um I think if you're going to do it, it's got to have to be short, sharp, you know, punching the ground away, aiming for around 200 milliseconds on the ground if you can do it. Because otherwise, it's got a pacing element to it. It's a bit like you wouldn't get somebody to do a 20-meter sprint and expect the reliability to be any good if you try and say, can you just run that 75% of your max effort and then see if a player can just regulate that between trials? It's it's going to be terrible. Whereas if you're going for max intent to really do a stiff strategy, punch the ground away like a pogo-type style or something like that, then actually your athletes are trying to do that. If they can't meet the criteria of a short contact time, then that's more likely telling you something about their neuromuscular qualities that maybe need to be adapted in a plyometric sense. Whereas if you're telling them to do like a depth jump or the counter movement rebound jumps where people have got 500 milliseconds on the ground, one rep, and then 350 milliseconds on the other rep, it's, it's telling us nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think the other thing is, is that we have to be mindful of our criteria for when we're testing athletes and we want to use the data to make decisions versus the other application of force plates, which is using them in gym training sessions to try and just inform rep by rep um, accumulation of, of, of forces and velocities and things like that, because they're two distinct things for me. You've got the stuff to give feedback to your athletes immediately for, say, four sets of six drop jumps that you're doing in the gym, and, and that's useful. Um, but there's also got to be an extra consideration around standardization of testing if you're actually going to have confidence in those numbers for any application that you might take forward so it's all the boring stuff it's that boring first year biomechanics stuff and i unfortunately have effectively done first year biomechanics 10 times because I, I did it myself as an undergrad and i taught it for nine years <laughs> but it, it's true all, all that stuff honestly is, is the stuff that <laughs> mean you can utilize your data really well afterwards whereas as soon as you start to let your standard slip and your standard operating procedures aren't adhered to then it's really difficult. It's really difficult to have confidence in the numbers because you can't separate out what's measurement error based on biological error due to the athletes experiencing some change in their neuromuscular system versus what's just error we've introduced as the people conducting the test. Sorry, Marcos. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add there, mate. No, no. So thank you, John. And I, well, I think it's a, a very good lesson. Also, I learned. And well, yeah, uh, I was, uh, I would add to what John said uh, that another important point is uh, the reliability because, well, at the moment, uh, we've got some data, John, uh, and also like uh, with my group. But uh, I think that reliability is something very, very important in terms of uh, testing. For example, uh, we are performing the isometric methane pool, which is perfectly known in the, let's say, UK strength and conditioning practices. However, when you come to Spain and you say, look, this is the isometric methane pool, they don't even know what is that. And second, well, you say uh, you need to acquire a position of the second pool of a power clean. And the next question could be, what is a power clean? I've never done that. Mm -hmm. So then you start like finding new problems that, for example, if you apply the isometric methane pool, for example, in weightlifters, rugby players, or whatever in UK, probably you, you won't have any problem with that because they have performed it before. They know how to do that. However, 
we need to establish this test and to implement this test in population that they are not getting used to it. So the point is that we know that there is one metric that is very reliable, which is the peak force. The peak force is very, very reliable. And I found that not only in football players of different categories, I found that also in handball players. I found that also in tactical population. I found that also in racket sports. So it's a metric that is very, very reliable. And I agree with Paul Comfort that has done some of this uh, podcast about the isometric method pool, that the rate of force development can be reliable as long as the people, they know how to perform the test. They are familiarized with the test and they are quite consistent performing it. However, in my experience or working with the population that I work in with the special characteristics of them and especially the history of uh, then with this kind of uh, test, the rate of force development is not reliable. Even though you perform some sets of familiarization, even though you try to uh, cue them properly, uh, so start pushing as much as possible from the beginning, even though you do all of those things, is quite difficult. It's very, very difficult. So in my in my experience and uh, well uh, we should focus on those metrics that uh, give us uh, a reliable information and also a good information i think that the peak force it gives you a good information about the maximal potential of uh, strength expression in uh, that athlete and maybe of course the rate of force development could be more valuable in terms of return to play, in terms of neuromuscular fatigue, of course. But so far, maybe we we are not in the situation of taking the rate of force development as a valuable metric. And we should just take the big force because it does. And I don't know if John wants to add something about the about this, but at least in my experience, working with the players that I'm working, working with the uh, athletes that I'm working is what I, I have served and also what I have analyzed so far. John, yeah, I, really, go on, mate. Oh, Sorry, man. I was just, I was just going to ask, Marcus, maybe to you and then John, you can expand on that. Is, is one of the main reasons behind that sort of what John was touching on before around that intent? So when they're going into, into that testing protocol, they're struggling to... Um, put that intent into the test because of lack of previous experience. Yeah, but what I said before, even though you try to cue them, yeah, like you need to perform it with maximal intent, and actually you can observe that they do. You can observe that they, they understood what you said, and they try to perform that with maximal intent. It's a posture that they are not familiar with. Yeah. You know, when you see, well, uh, I've got some background with weight lifters, and when you see a good weight lifter, they will perform a snatch or a clean and jerk, perfectly reliable between repetition, even though if you vary the load. However, when you see someone that is not a good weight lifter, that is, let's say, like mediocre, so they will perform the snatches, they will perform like the clean and jerk, but they won't be reliable. So there won't be a consistency between repetitions. I think it is like that. Even though they try to perform like a, that ISO pool with maximum intent, it's very difficult to them because they are not a, like quite familiarized with that position. However, the peak force, it's quite reliable even in that population. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, we should take the good points and we should like investigate about the let's say the the weaknesses of uh, of the testing that we are applying. John, have you got anything to add to that? No, all good points. I think the it's it's funny, isn't it? Like I've got to the point where people don't expect me to have a bias. I think towards doing force plate testing, and they did you know they're somewhat right, I suppose. But what we're trying to do is almost show 
if we can, why the force plate tests that we do and the metrics from them are actually useful to practitioners. And almost I'm at the point now in my my stage in my thinking that if we can't show that it has some utility, then we need to get rid of it. So if, if the test is too difficult to give us what we think theoretically would be a reasonable um, test and metric for that given population, then we need to improve the test and we need to or find another metric that is more reliable that basically gives us a proxy for the same thing. So part of that process is to do with reliability and you can have variables that you would say aren't reliable, but that's normally based on arbitrary cutoffs, like 10% for a coefficient of variation or less than 0.75 for an interclass correlation coefficient. But in fact, some of those variables that are quite noisy, if you think of it that way, could, could still be quite illuminating when it comes to things like injury and return to play criteria, for example. The problem is, is that Part of the problem, I think, really, is we don't understand what is a useful variable well enough from any of the tests yet, particularly the ISO pull, um, particularly from some of the rebound jumps. The counter movement jump seems to have shown greater utility across the spectrum of applications, but there's still loads of work to be done within football cohorts in particular in terms of exactly what, what you need to do with that test for a given purpose. Um, but one of the key things has been the name of the ISO pull because it's called a pull. People think they need to pull the bar where they need to push the feet, and, and that's effectively it. So unfortunately, its um, its origins are in weightlifting from the the mid nineteen nineties, mm. where people would know what you mean by pull at yeah. that point. Whereas really, it's got to be a push with the legs. And I, I've had players with, you know, two hundred and ten kilogram squat for six repetitions who can't beat me on the isometric mid thigh pull test. I ain't squatting you know, two hundred and ten kilograms for six repetitions. So I think for, for us, especially I'm conscious as like outsiders who aren't with the athletes every day, I always put notes in. If you suspect that somebody should be able to do better in the test than they're doing, I note back to the practitioner to say, do you know what? This may just be a total random number. Don't take any real you know, value from this test. Let's use it as a almost a, a learning opportunity for the athlete. And then let's see next time when we come in whether we can get more consistent data from that athlete to, to apply it that, that makes sense. Because if, you, if you're strong in a squat and a deadlift, or you're the strongest in the squad, but you're scoring bottom in the isometric mid-thigh pull for peak force, mm -hmm. it isn't really discriminating lower limb strength, is it? It's probably just that athlete doesn't know how to do the test. Mm -hmm. And so that's where things like isometric squats, isometric belt squats um, are starting to be explored in a bit more detail now. But the, but the big thing with understanding what a good score is going back to your original question about people just collecting data if they're using force plates is that takes time to understand and it's got to be done with some sort of statistical method as opposed to just plucking a number out of thin air and, and saying that you know 40 centimeters is a good score for a youth academy footballer and so therefore we're going to push them and so they, they reach 40 centimeter in that test yeah so i think that's the key thing i think we're fairly happy with the method that we're using at the minute to determine good bad or indifferent scores in these tests and then secondly, if you're going to benchmark, you've got to have a reason for using that test as a benchmark in the first place. And that's where we have seen, like Marcus and I have discussed, some merit in the rebound jump tests, the counter movement jump test, and the isometric mid thigh pull in discriminating between youth and senior, or even higher caliber youth athletes versus those that are a lower caliber, so like a semi-pro versus a pro type, type group split. Um, what we're not seeing as much of in the early data we've got so far is differences in the physical qualities between, say, League 2 senior men and championship senior men. So we've skipped one league out to give us a bit of breadth between the groups. Mm -hmm. And equally, somewhat for some of the metrics between Tier 6, so National League North players, compared to League 2, compared to Championship. So it actually might be that f some of these physical tests, bilateral physical tests, aren't going to discriminate between levels of play. Maybe that does come more down to technical and ta tactical differences between those players that discriminates why they play at the you know, higher league versus lower league. So in which case... Just on, on that, has that been um, between full... Because obviously at that level, some of them will be part-time, some will be full-time. Is that majority full-time teams yeah so this is the interesting thing for us in our country i think we've got you know six tier football 
clubs that are actually full time, like this national National League North teams that would have largely been semi pro, like the National League teams would have been a fairly even split between professional and semi professional going back even just a few years. Yeah. But you you've got full time professional footballers now that are in you know the tier six, um, and so I suppose if you if you then attract in through salaries players that maybe have played at higher leagues before that, that are coming down because they see a vision for the club and they wanting to contribute to them progressing through through the leagues. Maybe you're going to get less of a difference in the physical qualities between those players. I think it's an interesting one for us as well because we have things like the FA Cup, you know, where you can get tied against a team that's, you know, three or four leagues above you. Um, actually understanding what the physical outputs are from those players that you may potentially face that are leagues above. I suppose in some ways it might be comforting if the data consistently shows what we're seeing so far, that if you've got no real difference in some of these tests, bear in mind it's only some tests. We can add more in and we can think about speed and all these other things that we don't get from a force plate in terms of like sprint speed and change direction and things. Then then in some ways it, it kind of gives you some confidence that either your players are doing pretty well physically compared to those and you need to focus on something else. Mm-hmm. Um, or you might be way behind, in which case you might be thinking, okay, let's think about our tactics a bit more around um, how we can try and try and overcome that. But yeah, it's um, there's, there's loads of stuff to do. It's, there's loads of stuff to do. And that, that's why I enjoy it because we're pulling together as a, a multi-disciplinary uh, group across multiple nations. And I feel like it's the only real way to make any real progress because it gives you a big enough sample because I do feel sorry for practitioners that work with, you know, 25 athletes on a, on a day-to-day basis to try and actually make sense of their data with a small sample where you've got players that might end up not being able to do the testing. So you, you, your sample starts dropping down into the teens. Mm-hmm. doesn't give you really very much data points to, in, in a short-term basis anyway, to, to, to really formulate any conclusions around how to apply the data. So that's, that's where we're trying to fit, fit in basically. But there's not it's, it's it's different. So in terms of numbers, like we've got, for example, England women footballers um, average jump heights expected to be between thirty two and thirty six centimeters. For anyone that's that's listening that might be interested in that, that's exactly the same as professional um, Super League forwards in rugby, and and that's because of the they, they weigh about thirty to forty kilograms more on average compared to the women's football date that we've got, and then the backs in rugby actually. Are performing at a similar level to the League Two footballers that we've got, so they're about ten kilograms higher on average. But if you think about the resistance training culture in rugby and how that differs somewhat to what you see in professional football, in in these kind of ballistic and strength tests, they're they're actually for their mass that counts against them in the jumps, performing you would say superiorly to professional footballers, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so it all comes back down to the context after you've collected the data in terms of actually how you interpret it and, and make sense of it for the training recommendations that you might have for your athletes. Brilliant. John, you you spoke about the presentation you did for, for us at the Bolton event, which I know loads of people took an incredible amount from. Um, and I would say on that as well, that in terms of the positions that you use in a test and to be aware of, you covered that on the presentation. So anyone who wants to go and check that out can go and actually watch and see exactly what you're talking about. Um, I think that was a scout movement jump, wasn't it, when you, when you covered that? Um, but what I was going to ask about, because you mentioned in the meeting about collecting pre and post match data, match jump data. Yeah. So where is that up to and... Um, what are some of the findings and what's that looking like? Thank you. Um, so we've, we're have really days on it. We, but what we are doing is we're trying to collect some data in about two weeks. We're about two weeks too early for, for me giving more of a detailed answer. But there are obviously quite a few papers that have looked at jump performance pre or post-match and then usually 24 hours, 48 hours and 72 hours uh, afterwards as well or classified as match day plus whatever they've gone up to. Um, generally speaking, there's kind of, like with most things, fairly contrasting results depending on what text has been used. So if sometimes research, uh, the studies have, have published no differences in jump height, but that's all they've explored. So you don't know if anything else has changed other than of the jump height. Mm-hmm. Quite a bit of the research that's used force plates, and it's mainly counter movement jump in terms of which test is done with hands on hips, just, just to add that clarity in there. Um, Sometimes you get changes in jump height, 
but then they haven't shown any of the mechanisms underpinning why that jump height's changed. Yeah. And so so for us, we've done one study with National League uh, male footballers, and we did pre-post-match uh, a guy called Ryan Spencer, who's one of our master students. He actually did this for his undergrad dissertation, but he was working at a National League football club at the time, so that's how he got the access to, to them. And, and we found that the the jump height didn't change beyond the measurement error. But what did change is the the player's body weight by about two and a half kilograms, mm-hmm. um, which may reflect the, the level that we were testing at there. I mean, the, your body mass changing within a 90-minute match is largely going to come down to hydration. And potentially, if you haven't you know, fully carb load the night before, maybe a bit of glycogen, glycogen depletion or something or a mixture of the two. But in any case, the, the, the force plates indicated about a two and a half kilo on average body, body mass reduction. So in theory, if if you're lighter and you're not fatigued, you should, all things being equal, be able to jump higher because you're applying the same force capability to a lighter mass. So it should increase your take of velocity and therefore your jump height. So the first finding that jumped out to me was the fact that actually these players are two and a half kilos lighter, but they're actually jumping the same height. So that's kind of the first initial very tiny flag that maybe is this it's an indication of some fatigue event. And then secondly, the players went through a larger range of motion in the counter movement depth. So they basically squatted down a little bit further, which gives them slightly more distance when they're extending ankles, knees and hips before they leave the ground. So again, all things being equal, if you're not fatigued, you should be able to jump higher if you actually go through a larger range of motion because it's a bit like if um, if you're doing a sprint test, you expect your velocity to continue to increase up to maybe 40 meters but within that say initial 20 meters your velocity is going to continue to increase all the way through so we're talking differences in centimeters in counter movement depth not not meters as it relates to a sprint but all things being equal if you've got an extra two centimeters that you're pushing through and you've got the same neuromuscular capability you should achieve a higher speed just like you would do if you run a bit further in a sprint test and therefore you should jump higher so there's a couple of things that stood out is the reduction in body mice mass body mice um, none of those are included. Uh, body mass and also the kind of slightly larger range of motion they went through, but still couldn't jump higher. Mm. And then the other things are kind of like all trivial effects. So they were moderate to large effect sizes, the differences that we saw in those variables. So we, we currently, we're still writing that up. I think we've been writing that up for about six months. So that's on me to, to try and push push out. Um, but what we're doing going forward now is we, we've just ordered some more force plates. So we should have about eight sets of dual force plates. So our proposal that I've just sent out to a couple of local clubs um, in both the men's and the women's um, leagues is whether we can come and test the away and home players on the same night because we'll start with counter movement jumps because it's non-fatiguing, it's easy. We can put four sets of plates outside each dressing room and just see if we can get the players to perform the counter movement jumps at baseline, Um, extract some GPS and heart rate measures, which was lacking a bit in that first study that we did. And then when you come back in, another limitation of the research is because one of my PhD students, Andy Badby, um, has just done a scoping review on acute monitoring using force plates with athletes, is that either the studies don't report how long it was after the players finished the match to when they actually did the jumps, or some of them report a range of between 15 minutes and an hour. So I suppose if you've got some players that have had an hour to recover, and then you're testing them on the jumps versus those that have stepped off the pitch and, and done it within 15 minutes... You're comparing apples and pears straight away. So what we're trying to do with, you know, you know, about six members of staff and eight sets of force plates is see if we can get people to come in and just jump straight away, two to three trials max, um, as they are going back into the dressing room. So hopefully within like a 15 minute window of, of finishing the match, there's a lot of consent to get there. But I think that the good thing is, is because as much as anything, and I'm sure you'll know this, Ben, through for your federation uh, as well, is like a lot of the initial work we've been doing has been more about or as much about relationship building as anything else. Mm. Like we've shown that we can come in, we can do a good job, we can flip reports back to athletes the same, uh, practitioners the same day, mm. that we're open to going back in and doing doing more. Um, so we're at a point where hopefully the, the practitioners are trusting of us to come in and not interfere. Now, if whichever team loses, they may wish to point fingers at us to say it's because he did the jumps <laughs> before the test but i'm hoping that that won't be the case we, we're trying to pick fixtures you know where you've got two two teams where we know the practitioners that work there that are playing against each other where hopefully we can come in and do it and it won't be too encroaching but it'd be amazing if we can do that because like i say it won't take much time for the players we, we can test everybody 
10 minutes maximum, both pre and post match. Mm. And then we can drive to the clubs, you know, 48 hours later, probably. I don't know if anyone would be in match day um, plus one, but match day plus two, we could get and do the 48 hour thing. In terms of recovery, generally in the literature, any neuromuscular deficiencies in the counter movement jump seem to be restored by 48 hours. Um, the squat jump doesn't really tell you very much. It seems to be very much the jumps that have a uh, downward phase. So uh, in old money, I suppose, eccentric phase, like so I'm, I'm waiting and breaking phases. Um, rebound jumps have been done a little bit in Aussie rules football, not, not as much in football as we call it, like in soccer. So that's another line of inquiry as well, because I think there's some merit in trying to do some rebound jumps. But I'm I'm just conscious that what we don't want to do is go in, you know, and do a million tests and encroach too much on players and practitioners' time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to have to be more of a slow burner that we we start with the counter movement jumps, see what that shows us with good quality standards of, of data collection and reporting, match that with GPS and heart rate data for players that have played 70 minutes plus or whatever, and then and then to try and build that which we should be able to do fairly quickly because of the fact that we've got so much tech to take out to clubs, basically. Um, and then it's about, you, you know, we'll get to the questions later, but, you know, there's other tests, isometric hamstrings, there's other things that have been done with force plates in the literature in terms of trying to quanti quantify match-based fatigue, which we could potentially pursue going forward as well. Brilliant. I'm sure there's loads of practitioners now listening, thinking, yeah, we're keen. Um, so what I'd, I normally leave this to the end, but we'll put it in now. If people want to get in touch, Jack, like where would you where would you direct them? So they, they can email me at j.j.mcmahon at salford.ac.ac.uk. I fudged that, didn't I? I have to do that one again. Um, or at Force Plate Coach on Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. So uh, most of my messages come through Instagram, to be honest. Yeah. Um, my nephew rinsed me saying that I'm too old to be on Instagram, but I've got more followers than email, so he can wind his neck. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you get in touch with me via that, then um, that that's fine. But we, we're open. We, we've got a big team, keen team, and we, I think we've got lots of value we can add to that space in the literature. Brilliant. Lads, an hour has absolutely flown by because we've already done an hour. But if you're both okay with time, what I wanted to go into, which I'll open up to you, Marcus, in a second, is sort of future areas to focus on um future areas of research possibly like what is what is the future the short term and long term looking for for you marcus yeah all right <clears throat> well first of all it's always a pleasure to listen to john so john thank you for all the information that you have provided us i always nice. learn when i listen to you and yeah just uh, linking to John has said, to what John has said, I think that the, the main point and probably like a, an ending message to the people is that uh, there is no one metric that give us all the information and we need to be aware of that and practitioners need to be aware of that. So what is important is to understand all the points that underpins any metric. For example, in terms of a pre post match, it's important to understand that not only jump height, but also like the body weight and other variables are important and we need to take them into account. It was something that uh, we were doing, let's say wrongly, when we were testing the jump height with, uh, for example, contact mats or uh, optoelectronic devices, because we we couldn't be aware of the of these metrics. Now we can be aware of the of those. And uh, I think it's very, very important. So what we need now is to, to keep doing research. And uh, this research uh, need to be like a, about reliability of the different metrics. Also trying to make all tests better. For example, John said something very interesting about the differences between the isometric method pool, the iso belt or uh, something like that, if we want to, to call that in that name, and also the ISO squad. And it could be interesting in the future to see if uh, there, there is a real differences in, uh, in the metrics of those tests. And more important, what test is more reliable and what test is more applicable? Because for example, uh, the isometric squad might be more reliable. However, if you, 
if you try to develop the isometric squat in a football team that they have no culture of strength mm -hmm. and you tell them that they will have to perform an isometric squat like with all the pressure in the spine and all of these things i know that for me that's not important uh, in terms of i know they will be safe but for the strength and conditioning coach and also for the for the manager uh, he won't allow you that so sometimes it's uh, let's say a balance between what we want to do and what we can really do yeah and trying to find the best option or the fault, the option that fit fits it better so for sure uh, the future will be in terms of uh, the basic so we need to discover the basics first if the test is not, not reliable second if we can apply that like uh, let's say effectively and also efficiently and uh, then to discover if there are differences between talent identification so if the test is sensible enough to detect or sensitive enough to detect uh, differences between different athletes different sports also different categories i think that that will be the let's say the research line brilliant like yourself jam just cheers, Marcos, for your kind words. Like me, Marcos, we we message each other every day, Marcos, don't we? I speak to Marcos more than I speak to my wife, so it's uh, <laughs> it's great. It's great to have such a good friend and um, and and person that's that's on the ground, honestly, applying this him and his team like really, 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 really well, um, which has opened up so many opportunities, not just for Marcos, but for, for myself and my colleagues as well. Um, in terms of future stuff for us, we we're trying to. I have this, I put this in the presentation, which again, you said before people can watch that I did back in November, but to try and remember the main applications of force plates, I created the acronym BRIEF. So the B is for benchmarking and talent ID. The R is for return to sport guidance. So that's one of the areas we're just starting to embark on. The I is for injury screening, which is a bit of a, you know, a difficult one, but but to be fair, there's some promise, particularly with some of the data coming out from uh, American military research groups at the moment, which is quite cool. Um, the E is the exercise prescription or programming side, which is mainly what we've been doing as well, you know, through things like dynamic strength index and, and um, combining the strength with the ballistic and the plyometric tests. And then lastly, the F is the fatigue monitoring, which I kind of touched on slightly before. So you've heard the fatigue monitoring side, but the, the big thing for us now is to push forward more into the injury screening and the return to sports space, because we get a lot of questions around which tests, about asymmetries, about single joint tests, about what we should do as athletes progress through the different forms of the rehab post-ACL and hamstring injury and things. And, and to be quite frank, we don't actually know the answers to most of those questions right now. But what we do know, though, is that the, the force plates can give us some good indication of athletes that are still deficient in their neuromuscular function post-ACL. So if anyone's not seen um, Helen Baines' blog she helen baines a biomechanist down in south africa and she's really well she's a fantastic biomechanist but also she's got a really easy to read blog um that explains some of the research that she's been doing in collaboration with matt jordan who's based out in canada around force plate profiles of acl injured athletes and effectively the the what seems to be interesting is that if you do a bilateral counter movement jump even if you've had a significant low limb injury you can't necessarily detect too much of a deficiency between the injured and the uninjured limb during a bilateral test. But if you do a unilateral version, then there's quite profound differences, particularly at the lowest point of the counter movement. So the highest acceleration tends to occur as we transition from having hit the brakes hard to stop into then immediately trying to propel ourselves through forceful extension of ankles, knees, and hips. And there's about a 20% reduction. Like some people refer it to it as force at zero velocity. Uh, for those that are less familiar with squiggly lines, it's basically the force at that very transition between braking and propulsion or the end of the eccentric phase and the start of the concentric phase. And in even ACL injured athletes that are two years post ACL, it seems to be still the case that there's some deficiencies in that ability to express force rapidly at the high acceleration point, which is at that transition point. 
and there's, there's some other research now showing that a lot of the hot testing that's been traditionally done as part of return to sport following ACL isn't seemingly sensitive enough. Do you know, if you're using a tape measure mm-hmm. to determine single, triple or crossover hops and all these things that, that have been done quite quite a lot in the past, that actually the unilateral counter movement jump could be much more useful in, in that respect. So I strongly recommend that if anyone's interested, if you, if you read Helen Bain's blog, it's like, um, you know, the penultimate blog post that she did not too long ago. It's, it's really easy to understand and there's some really good figures on there as well. And then I suppose, other than what Marco said about key take-homes, I would say if you're interested in force plates, read from some of the authors that, that have been doing this research for quite a while. So people like Jason Lake, John Harry, Justin Merrigan from out in the States has been doing loads of work in this space, like across uh, first responders and emergency services and um, military personnel. And then, like I say, Helen Bain as well, that's, that's been classifying the different patterns of, of force production during jumps, uh, particularly in reference now to, to ACL injured athletes, which is obviously a big injury that plagues football still now as much as it did, did do, if not more so, uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so I suppose that's a key thing. If, if you're stepping into any space, it's important, I think, to do your due diligence and go back through and try and see if you can understand some stuff and then everyone's really approachable like all those people that i mentioned if you ask them questions on social media they'll they'll get back probably much earlier than i do i'm pretty but even though i said getting in touch with me before i will eventually a few days later um and then lastly what we're trying to do have you heard of the manchester institute health and performance near yeah. where man, man city train uh, there's a physio called chris brammer who's a, an academic here and he works over a, uh, at the clinic there as well we just got some force plates that we've bought that are going to go and reside in that clinic because they see a lot of the football injured athletes that don't have the facilities are supposed to go through the, the screening and the rehab in house. So like league one, league two, predominantly you've got private medical that gets sent over to the MIP for that element of it. So yes. normally, normally what happens with those guys is they, they get the athletes when they're already injured. So they'll take baseline measures in terms of physical qualities and functional tests um, but then they're trying to return to sport based off an already deficient score because they're already injured at that point. So what we're trying to do is get them the same kit. We're testing those players or a lot of them anyway, or we're understanding what's typical when athletes are healthy so that then when they come in and they're injured, they will go through a physical testing battery that's the same as what we're doing out at different clubs anyway, where we take the lab out to different places. And what we're trying to do then is prospectively now over the next few years is try and understand more so these physical tests that maybe are important for both injury screening and return to sport and then tracking them throughout that whole return to sport process. And uh, Chris has got a big vision. Um, so again, he's you'll find him on social media as well, Chris Brammer, around how we can try and get force plates into the healthcare service, particularly private medical places, and start doing that more routinely with, with all sorts of sports, but particularly football, given that's the bulk of what we're doing right now. Incredible. Well, that's absolutely unbelievable information. Are you both okay with taking a few of these questions that have been sent in? Absolutely, Marcos is, aren't you, mate? you can can set the hard ones we'll we'll start to work through a few of them and we'll see where we get to with it so um one of the first ones sent in uh this person said i'd be interested to hear their approach around fatigue monitoring via four stacks whether that be metric selection in cmjs and why or any other tests that would consider important such as such as isometric hamstring variations etc and again, what metrics in these will potentially inform their decision making around fatigue and recovery? Who wants to go? Do you want me to go, Marcos? Yep, go for it. Uh, so I've touched a bit on the, the fatigue stuff with jumps. In terms of metrics, though, aside from the ones I mentioned before, um, so I'm, well, I've mentioned body weight, which effectively you could do on scales, to be fair, um, but jump momentum is body mass times takeoff velocity. So that that's one of the metrics that was shown in that study that Ryan Spencer did for his undergraduate, which I didn't actually mention before. Uh, flight time to contraction rate, time ratio or reactive strength index modified, they're effectively the same thing. Um, the numbers are different, but they'll show you the same pattern where you take either the jump height and divide it by the time to take off, or you take the flight time and divide it by the contraction time, which is just another name for time to take off. Um, so effectively it's a, a how high did you jump for any given time on the ground? So like an efficiency type metric that they, they, they've been shown in a few papers going back even to like 2008 and nine, like Stu McCormack's work. 
um, to be sensitive to, to fatigue. So I'll probably start with some of those. But the big thing is, I think just if you're collecting that data and you do it well, you should be able to see some of the patterns between changes in outcome and what led to that change in outcome. And you can only really do that if you understand which variables link to each other. Um, so I can maybe share some resources afterwards with like a bit of a, almost a deterministic model showing how all the variables connect, because I think one of the troubles for practitioners, and I assume that's where this question has been born from is this like maybe, maybe 180 variables that you automatically get given when you do a force plate test. A lot of them tell you the same thing actually in terms of patterns. So you can reduce those variables and Justin Merrigan, who I mentioned before, he's done a couple of papers on dimensionality reduction. So basically taking all those variables and then clustering them into the types of ones that tell you the same things. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason really to be taking more than about a handful of variables that link the strategy of the jump with the outcome of the jump and then the forces that effectively influence that strategy. In terms of hamstrings, you've got uh, the 9090 and um, 30 degree of, of knee flexion isometric hamstring test. So where your heel's on the force plate on a box, you're setting the knee angle and then you're driving your heel down into the plate. There's a, a few papers now on that. McCall was the first one to do it. And he showed in, I think it was League One French uh, senior males that the test was reliable first and foremost. And then also it showed a reduction post-match in 90-90 and 30-30 conditions um, with both the dominant and the non-dominant limbs. So you basically got some evidence with that test that it will give you some indication of how fatigued the hamstrings get during match play. Um, I don't think he did a follow-up in his study, but Emma was Constantine, now Tavana, did um, a couple of years ago. And I'm pretty sure that she did it with youth players where they also showed a reduction at both of the joint angles in isometric force capabilities post-match. And then also still at 24 and 48 hours, but mainly interestingly in the stronger players. So the players that actually had the highest baseline um, isometric hamstring force capabilities showed the greatest drop-off in force capability post-match and actually took longer to recover uh, up to 72 hours post-match. So maybe that links the performance and yeah, in, in terms of your hamstrings, we talk about hamstrings a lot in terms of injury risk, but obviously the hamstrings are fundamental in terms of actually achieving high sprint velocities in the first place. So maybe the stronger athletes are performing more high intensity actions in a match. Therefore, they're dropping off by a greater magnitude in terms of their force capabilities and the hamstrings post-match and taking a little bit of a longer time to recover. But I'm not sure if anyone else has totally unpacked that, but I'll just add that to the list while we're talking and see if there's uh, something we can do in that. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add on to that, Marcos. No, actually, you have said everything that they could say that's cool just just additionally onto that um they also thought would they consider different types of tests or metric was it within those tests for different types of athletes so i'm not sure whether that's different types of athletes from different sports or different types of i suppose players position wise and marcos you're well, working across the multiple yeah so. i could say that uh, if we are talking about the sports, I think that uh, something that is very important is to study first the sport. Mm -hmm. It's just to see the biomechanics that underpins that sports. For example, in uh, balonmano, as I said before, uh, so it's handball in English. Uh, in handball, uh, the players are usually bigger, so the contact time is longer, and probably uh, some metrics like react like the RSI modified is more important for very specific players uh, I don't know if you have uh, ever seen a, a humble uh, match but <clears throat> there are people that play let's say in the frontal line and they are really big they have long contact time to develop force. And what I see, and what I I saw in uh, our uh, assessment is that they have higher peak forces, especially in the ISO pool, and also the RSI modified for both tests, the counter moment and rebound jump, and also for the counter moment jump, is lower than the players that play on the sides. The players that they, that played on the sides, they tend to be let's say lighter. And also they tend to be like, uh, well, they, they play with uh, more changing of directions, like uh, more speed, etc. 
So what is very important is first to see like how these players differ in terms of what they need to, to have a good performance. And well, uh, that's within a sport and also between sports. I think that, for example, football is a totally different sport compared with handball, compared with rugby. And uh, probably football will be like uh, one of those sports that players are more homogeneous in ter- in compared with other sports. If you look at rugby players, so a forward, it's a totally different athlete compared with a back. So in uh, handball, uh, for handball players, is kind of the same. And I don't know, like uh, for hockey or other sports. So first of all, we need to understand that sport. Then after that, just to, to take the measures. Brilliant. Well, as if we just do one final one, because I'm aware that I could keep you all day on this topic. I think we could we could keep going, couldn't we? But um, we'll just do one final one. So this one was sent in. Uh, when testing during rehabilitation, in brackets, knee surgery, what are the metrics they expect would be the last to return to normal pre-injury slash opposite limb? John, do you want to... John? I think we've, we've not having a full handle on that particular area is, is similar to what I said before. I should think the way the research is going, and some of this hasn't been published yet, but I've seen it through the conferences that I've been at this past year, so it should come out at some point this year. I, I think it will be the unilateral um, injured, so the symptomatic limb, during that transition point between breaking and propulsion. But there's also some people having a look now at force plates for broad jumps as well and there's some indication that there might be some interesting information there but the the problem is I think most of the people who are listening that use force plates are probably using a vertical only axis force plate so you're not going to be able to take any horizontally orientated movement with those plates like if you have got a you know triaxial force plate that'll give you anterior posterior and medial lateral then you can start start to explore some of those options so for those of us that are restricted to vertical only tasks then it seems like the unilateral jumps and looking at force at zero velocity or it might be called force at minimum displacement. And most athletes should, in theory, if they're efficient jumpers, achieve the highest force at that point. And it seems to be that those that are injured actually achieve the peak much later in the propulsion phase. So they're going through like a longer acceleration pathway, if you like, until they reach the peak acceleration, because that's what the peak force reflects, just the peak acceleration applied to body mass. Uh, which is categorized as an inefficient jump strategy or one that might illuminate future injury risk, but that's needing a bigger body of work to have a look at, but certainly is based on what Helen Bain and um, Matt Jordan and people have been looking at recently seems to be the biggest line of inquiry right now, as far as I'm aware anyway. Brilliant. Well, I just want to say massive thank you for coming on and giving up your time and taking some of those questions as well. Big thank you to everyone that sent questions in. We didn't quite get through them all, but I think you covered a lot of the other questions in everything else that you spoke about. John, you've mentioned your sort of contact details, force plate coach on, on socials and your email, which I'll put in the show notes as well. Thank you. And um, Marcus, can you, can you give us yours? And also, I know you've got some speaking engagements coming up as well. So if you'd like to mention those too. Yeah, well, uh, in terms of, uh, for example, my email, it could be msoriano, tap, uh, you say jc, tap com. So, well, I will, if you want, I will pass it to you and then you can post. So yeah. for me, it will be great if you can, if you want to share it. And can you remember me the, the last uh, point that you said? Um, just the speaking engagement. So um, in terms of the conference coming up that you're going to be speaking at. All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, uh, next October, it will be the, I think the days were 6th and 7th uh, of October. So we will have, we will host uh, a conference, a national conference here in Spain, but it will be international as, for example, John, Paul and some others uh, speakers they are coming to spain uh, this is for a uh, well uh, we have a strength and neuromuscular performance network in spain 
and we formed that network like different researchers and also strength and conditioning coaches like uh, around Spain. And well, uh, what we try to do in this kind of uh, conferences is just to, to bring the new updates about, for example, force plates or uh, any other topics that uh, are now hot topics in terms of practical application and everything. The cost of the conference is quite cheap because the main goal is the diffusion of all the information that we have now. And it will be in Madrid. And well, uh, that's all I can say so far because uh, very soon I will reveal all the speakers that will come. Also, we will have like a practical workshops. Uh, I hope that one of them, it will be for John about uh, force plate testing. And well, I think it will be a good opportunity to, to share our ideas with uh, other uh, people. The last one that we did, it was in Granada. So John came and did one workshop. And uh, well, it was actually very good because we've got uh, we got uh, 250 people in Spain. All of them, they were uh, practitioners. So like the information, I think it was really, really good. And Granada, although it is a beautiful city, John can tell you that. The problem is that there is no good connection. But however, this year being in Madrid, there is good connection, good international connection, and also with the rest of Spain, with the well, uh, the national territory. So I think it will be great to to enjoy this conference and to host this conference, and we will learn so much. Brilliant. And your your socials, Marcus, your Marcus underscore Soriano nineteen ninety one on Instagram, Marcus A Soriano one over on Twitter, so people can go and give you a follow and um, keep an eye out for more details as we get closer to October as well. That's correct. Yeah. Perfect. Thank Lads, thank you so much. That's been absolutely brilliant. We've covered loads of stuff there. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Ben. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and also with our good friend Marcos as well. So it's it's been great. Um, and yeah, keep, keep up the good work with the Federation as well because it's, it's amazing all the networking events that you're yeah. putting on as well, I've got to say. Thank you, mate. Yeah, thank you very much, Ben. I really appreciate your invitation. And well, although it is not my, let's say my mother tongue, I always appreciate to talk with uh, uh, good people like you, like John, and also to, to spread this. And well, another good point, it could be to do that in Spanish because we could cover another population, which is in South America and all of these parts. And I think it could be very, very interesting because, well, some of them that are not English speakers. Yeah. It could be great to to spread this word and this information to them. But it's always good. Thank you very much. It was a great opportunity. Brilliant. Thanks, lads.